Hello and happy Mother's Day from the Center for Spiritual Living Carlsbad. I'm Reverend Kate, and it's my pleasure to greet you and to know that this day holds only good for you. So welcome. First, congratulations to all you mothers. We honor you today. And on behalf of everyone in the whole wide world, I want to thank you. It's thanks to you that we're alive. Although, maybe we should give a little credit to those fathers too. Thank you, fathers. And really, everyone, everyone, whether you have ever been a parent or not, I want you to just stop and give thanks to yourself too. Just close your eyes and imagine yourself surrounded in a cloud of pink. Pink motherly love. Give yourself a hug. After all, you have been in, in charge of taking care of your very own inner child for all these years. That inner child, that perfect spark of love that we all carry within ourselves. Mother's Day is a perfect day to give thanks, right? Even if your own childhood might not have seemed perfect, it brought you to this moment, this moment in consciousness where you can still discover that sacred truth that when we see the world through eyes of love, with an open heart, we will find that there is always good in expression. And this is what I have gradually come to realize through the study of the science of mind. There is always good. There is always enough. And moreover, that it is our thoughts and our beliefs that create the avenues in which this power for good is expressed. Now, it may seem like this is a radical new belief, but actually, we're following a path that was marked out for us by the trailblazers of the past. While it was Ernest Holmes who founded our specific teaching in the early 1900s, and of course, as a religious science minister, I think he set forth a very solid and practical path for us to understand and use new thought principles. But he didn't just invent our teaching from scratch. Holmes himself wrote this. There would be no religious science movement had there not first been a new thought movement. We are one of the new thought groups of America which have influenced the thought of the world and of this country more than any other single element in it. That is, spiritually, religiously, theologically, psychologically too. But the New Thought Movement itself, which originated in America, had its roots in very deep antiquity. So today I want to talk to you about the mothers of our movement. I'm not going to take you all the way back to antiquity today so you can relax, but we do need to step back in time. So let's go back a few generations. Just think about the fact that today it's been 75 years since the end of World War II. It ended back in 1945. My mother Jane was 12 years old then. My grandmothers June and Marion were young mothers in their 30s, working, caring for their family. Two of my great-grandmothers, Maud and Sarah, were living here in California at the time also. And one of them, my father's grandmother, Sarah, had grown up in Encinitas. 
on her parents' homestead. That's right, the family had traveled from New York to Encinitas by sea and by stagecoach, arriving in 1874. Her father, Hector, was a Civil War veteran, and he had been working as a surveyor in New York after the war when he fell down into a well and was very fortunately rescued by his soon to become wife, also named Sarah. It's a fantastic story, right? Even more fantastic, Hector had survived a shipwreck when he was only three years old, when his family had immigrated from Scotland and their ship sank three miles off the coast of Nova Scotia. And that takes us back to 1843 when our story begins. I'm sure that all of you have other amazing stories in, in your backgrounds too, but probably like my family, if you go back five, six, seven generations, just little snippets of the stories come through to us. So in the 1840s, California was still part of Mexico. Our mission, San Luis Rey in Oceanside, had already been secularized by the Mexican government. The Lozueño Indians had been freed, and Agua Hedionda Rancho had just been created by a land grant. Cattle ranching was the business of the day. The hides were shipped from Dana Point, where they were tossed off the cliffs onto the ships waiting below. So that was this area. Meanwhile, back east, things were very different in the 1840s. It had only been 60 years since the end of the Revolutionary War, but life was bustling. American clipper ships were sailing the seas at what were considered to be amazing speeds. It took only three months to go all the way from New York to San Francisco. In the Northeast, industrialization was growing and factory towns were springing up. And for the first time, young women had a place to work so that they could actually leave the farms and get an honest job. 8,000 young women were working in the textile mills of Lowell, Massachusetts by then, and there were many other mill towns. Even though the women then were paid only half what a man earned, it gave them a foothold to economic independence that had really never existed before. So back in this bustling place and time, People were curious, just like we are, and they wanted to learn, just like we do. They went to church and listened to sermons, and they set up discussion groups, and they attended lectures by traveling speakers. Eventually, Ralph Waldo Emerson would become one of the most popular and well-known lecturers. He and Henry David Thoreau are now the most well-known American transcendentalists. But back then, they were just part of a group of like-minded friends who had started the Transcendental Club a few years earlier in 1936. There were two women who were also members of that club and one of the founding members, the woman I really want to start talking about, was Margaret Fuller. She's not very well known today, but back then she was very influential. Now, Margaret Fuller was actually considered to be the best read person in all of America, a genius. She was editor of the Transcendentalist magazine called The Dial, and she wrote many of its articles. But she is best known 
for her then very controversial book called Women in the 19th Century. It was the very first book written by any American advocating for women's rights and their equality. So now today, it's been a hundred years since women gained the right to vote. But back then in the 1800s, not being able to vote was not the only problem women faced. Back then, once a woman married, she couldn't own any property or money, no matter whether she had inherited it or whether she had earned it herself. Lower class women, most of the women in America worked very, very hard, but middle class women were limited too. They were not expected to get an education, but they were expected to stay home take care of the family, and stay out of public life. Men were in charge of all decisions and all finances for the family. So Margaret Fuller was definitely a little ahead of her times. Her family had raised her to learn as much as possible and to think for herself. Most women back then had very little legal say in any decision, even when it came to children, children that they were supposed to be in charge of. They didn't have any child custody rights and their daughters were still expected to marry for money and status. And if a marriage went sour, often the women were left completely helpless and broke. So Margaret Fuller's book came out in 1843. And not only did it advocate the rights of women, it also advocated for an end to slavery. She declared that all human beings were being damaged by what were then the habits and customs of society. She said that the repression of women had also resulted in terrible repression of men. They had been pressured into striving for financial success and had not been allowed to engage in any other of their interests. She said that really it wasn't so much that women lacked power because she believed like us that everyone had power that women had power if they wanted to exert it, and she chastised women for so often using their powers to manipulate or in superficial ways. What she said the real problem was, was a lack of freedom. Freedom to express a person's true nature. And that when women lack that freedom, men also lack this freedom. Regarding marriage, she said that a person first needed to be a unit, to know themselves as an individual before they could become part of a unity and join together. They should first be themselves and know themselves, and then they should be able to marry for friendship. She advocated what was called a natural marriage, what you might think of as a love match. She said it should be based on true love and companionship, and she called for an end to the practice of marrying daughters off to the richest man around. She felt that this practice only debased both the man and the woman and their life, that it caused eventually misery and suffering, and that they should be allowed to enjoy the rewards that a harmonious and true marriage could provide. Very controversial. Very controversial also in her time, but now fully incorporated into our New Thought teaching. 
She said that there was no such thing as a holy masculine man or a purely feminine woman. She believed that male and female represented two sides of something spiritual, something that was perpetually passing into one another. She wrote in her book that nature provides exceptions to every rule. She sends women to battle and sets men spinning. She enables women to bear immense burdens, cold and frost. She enables the man who feels maternal love to nourish his infant like a mother. Man partakes of the feminine as intuition, she said, and woman partakes of the masculine as, woman, as wisdom. She also gave some advice about the nature of life and staying healthy, which we might follow. She said that the body was the organ of the soul, and she declared that it is time indeed that men and women should both cease to grow old in any other way than as the tree does, full of grace and honor. She defined religion as the thirst for truth and good and wrote that man is a being of twofold relations to nature beneath and to intelligence above. The earth is our school, if not our birthplace. God, our object, life and thought, our means of interpreting nature and aspiring to God. Like us, the American transcendentalists believe that people and nature itself were inherently good they believe that people are at their best when they are self-reliant. And they believe that all of us are outlets for a oneness which unites us. They called it the oversoul. Fuller proclaimed that God has no gender, that God is not a he, but is spirit itself. And this idea has played a big role in the unfolding of new thought as a revolutionary religious movement in which women have played a great role. Margaret Fuller's ideas didn't just influence us, she influenced American thought. And she helped pave the way for other independent women to have their verses, voices hold too. I think it's fair to really call her a courageous great-grandmother of our New Thought teaching. Sadly, she and her husband and their young son, like so many other travelers, drowned in a shipwreck in 1850. Even so, her ideas live on. It was only a decade later, in 1861, that the American Civil War broke out, changing America forever. So many soldiers died or were wounded on both sides. There was so much suffering and loss. The country was only 34 million, and yet over a million people lost their lives. Three million slaves were freed. Battlegrounds lay in ruins. Abraham Lincoln had been assassinated. And Reconstruction moved forward with many difficulties. But despite it all, finally, most of the people of the nation were once more at peace and the healing of the country began. So with the war over, 
with peace at hand, there was an amazing explosion of ideas and inventions. The theory of evolution, the tractor, the telegraph, the rubber tire, the sewing machine, the vacuum cleaner. It was the age of the steamboat and of the transcontinental railway. And religion changed too. The idea that God is merciful and loving became widespread. The idea that people could help to ensure their own salvation by their good works grew. And so, of course, social reform movements grew. Black men received the right to vote. And eventually, in 1920, women did too. Child labor was finally restricted. Schools sprang up. And civic improvement organizations like the YMCA were started. The lives of women began to change too. Middle-class women and men began to have more time and freedom to explore ideas and were eager to go back and read and attend those lecture series. At this was the time when Emerson, Dickens, Mark Twain, and many others were on the speaker circuit, taking train from town to town, talking to amazingly interested and open-minded men and women who filled their lecture halls. In 1875, Mary Baker Eddy started the Christian Science Religion. So if we think of Margaret Fuller as our spiritual great-grandmother, we could call Mary Baker Eddy our spiritual great-aunt. Eddy had been healed by P.P. Quimby, the man who had really studied and written about the practice of spiritual healing and how to do it in a very methodical way. And although Christian science differs from what we teach in some important ways, they don't go to medical doctors, we do, and their ideas about the nature of matter and reality are a little different than ours. We still need to acknowledge the role that Eddie played in the evolution of new thought, for she did influence our thinking, and she was also among the early pioneers who spoke of God as non-gendered, referring to mother, father, God. And Eddie attracted many women students. And in 1883, Emma Curtis Hopkins became one of her students and quickly moved up and was made editor of the Christian Science Journal. But then the two women had a falling out. We don't quite know why, but lucky for us and our teaching, Hopkins resigned, left her family behind in Boston, and took a train out to Chicago, where she offered her first class in what we now call New Thought. So Emma Curtis Hopkins is now referred to as the teacher of teachers, and her students include, included the founders of Divine Science, the founders of Unity Church, and the founder of our own religious science centers for spiritual living. Ernest Holmes. I really do think we can call her the mother of new thought. She made the connection between individual mind and universal mind clearly, eloquently, mystically, and yet she made it approachable. She laid out a trail that we still follow today using our God-given tools of intellect, intuition, 
and simply cultivating an openness to experiencing the presence of good. Hopkins was born in 1850, the very same year that Margaret Fuller had died. And she lived 75 years until 1925. She lived through the Civil War. She lived through the First World War. She lived through momentous changes taking place in America. I'd like to share a description of her that was written by Mabel Dodge Luhan, who went to her for spiritual treatment back in 1920. Luhan wrote this. Hopkins sat in her little drawing room in the Iroquois Hotel, clothed in an exquisite gown, all soft black lace and silk, a large brimmed hat on her soft white hair. And she smoothed and relaxed one so that at the end of one's hour, one was renewed and reassured. I sat before her in a comfortable armchair three times a week. She stimulated and renewed one, causing the love and faith that life congealed to flow again. And she was so flattering. She loved us all, or seemed to. She looked at us in turn, and saw only the undying spirit buried in us, as though she cared only for that. She would gaze at us during our hour with eyes shining with love and tenderness, enhancing in each of us our feeling of worth. And then at the end of the hour, she would rise, go to the door, and smiling a little, she would bow us out. I love that description of Emma Curtis Hopkins. It is so motherly, so loving. It describes her as seeing through the eyes of love, as making a deep, soul to soul connection, the essence of motherly love. You know, behind the idea of a physical mother, there is a spiritual idea, a greater truth about mothering, nurturing, creating, bringing life forth, into manifestation. Today, it's true. Now, there seems to be a lot of trouble and loss in the world right now. But at the very same time, it's also true that there are a lot of amazing good things happening in our world right now, right today. People are sharing. People are caring for each other. People are nurturing, mothering, making a connection, seeing the world with eyes of love. That's the truth. That's the truth about us. And we can give thanks that each of us has this ability that we share and that is being shared with us at all times. So happy Mother's Day. Happy Connection Day. Today and every day to each and every one of you. Blessings. I love you. It's a wonderful day to be alive, and so it is.